Thanks so much for talking to us, Mary. And a lot of people, I think, um, are really interested in your perspective in terms of how your uncle, uh, Donald Trump, is going to react to this news. First and foremost, you wrote me a funny text. I hope it's okay if I share it with uh, this audience. But you said, sure. uh, consider yourself lucky that you're not out on the golf course with him right now. Um, yeah. What? Tell me, uh, first of all, do you know who he was playing golf with? Because I haven't been able to find that out. He was playing in Sterling, Virginia. And what do you think the reaction to the fact that this this pres this race has been called for Joe Biden is? Oh, he's not going to be able to accept that reality um, for a very long time, if ever. So, uh, you know, I, I think we've seen in the last couple of days, last few days since uh, early Wednesday morning, how badly he's going to handle this. He uh, claimed that he'd won when he had not, uh, when votes were still being counted. He's been undermining people's belief and faith in the legitimacy of an American election, which is unheard of in our history and cannot be forgotten. Uh, that, that, was not, um, that was not something to be taken lightly. The difference now, however, uh, is as much damage as he tried to do, and, and quite frankly did, um, he's entirely ineffectual now. The results are the results. It doesn't matter if he accepts them or not. It doesn't matter if he makes a concession speech or gives Joe Biden a phone call. All that matters now is that whatever Donald does or does not do, there will be a peaceful transfer of government. There will be, uh, you know, the American people for the, uh, for the most part will accept the results of the election. And, you know, he's just gonna make life miserable for him, himself and everybody around him including those who were unfortunate enough to be in the golf, golf course with him. Well, I mean, does he, who gives uh, him the bad news? I mean, are there any people around him who can actually speak to him in a rational way and say, this is the situation, uh, basically you lost and we have to figure out a path forward for you. Um, or are, is everyone around him basically reinforcing his point of view? Well, unfortunately, I think we've seen that it's the latter. Uh, you know, I just heard recently that people on his team are continuing with these frivolous lawsuits. They are not accepting the results of the election. Uh, and it's, I, you know, it's hard for me to understand why they think that's a good strategy because all it does is continue to undermine any claim to legitimacy he ever had so um i i put it down to fear and unwillingness to confront him and um you know the recognition that they probably know that he's not going to accept it uh, and the people around him are, are quite frankly, uh, they're there for a reason. You know, we, we cannot claim that these people have the high ground or that they have any kind of courage. So it's going to be very interesting, not, not necessarily pleasant, but interesting to see how it plays out. You know, people are asking, you know, are, are you, you're completely estranged from the most people in the family, correct? Mm -hmm. Or uh is there anyone in the family you speak to mary at this point uh no um and that's it's been that way for quite some time so that's that's it has nothing to do with um the election or it actually doesn't even have anything to do with the book because it was long before that that i'd stopped that we had stopped speaking so someone's asking about uh if you how you think ivanka don jr uh eric uh, I guess, Kimberly Guilfoyle, um, this whole posse of, of people around him will, will react. And are they just basically yesing him to death? I'm sure they are. Uh, one thing we need to understand about their Donald's relationship with his children is that they are entirely transactional, but they're also conditional. So his kids know what they need to do in order to stay on Donald's good side. 
Uh, also, I think they're probably uh, biding their time. Because on the one hand, they know upon which side their bread is buttered. But on the other hand, this may not go well for Donald. He is now, uh, at least uh, he will be in January, open to prosecution, uh, open to investigations. There are going to be a lot of people who rightfully want him held accountable for all of the egregious harm he's done to our country. And I, I, I would not be surprised if his children were also involved in some of the alleged crimes that the New York State AG and the SDNY are currently investigating. Are you worried about, you know, I think a lot of people are trepidatious, Mary, about his decision-making skills and some of the things that he'll be doing until he is no longer president. It was interesting. I heard that Joe Biden was assembling a COVID-19 task force right now, but yes. he as president-elect has so much authority until he's inaugurated. So that's 74 days. Um, are you concerned about what kind of decisions and potential damage might be done between now and the inauguration? I'm very concerned about it. I think all of us should be concerned about it. It is a ridiculously long time uh, for a transition. I'm not entirely sure why it's so long. But in this particular case, it's, it's, it's way too long because Donald is not uh, faring well, but um, he's vindictive, he's desperate, and he's going to need to do something to um, gain some kind of equilibrium you know, uh, again, he's never going to accept this loss. He's going to have to spin it in a particular way. But it is a blow, whether he's consciously aware of it or not. So he may well use the power he continues to have until January 20th to exact some forms of revenge. So we all need to be prepared for that. You know, we it could come in the form of outrageous executive orders that further... Um, weaken us in some ways. It could come in the form of pardons that demoralize us. It could come in the form of, and this is the one I'm, I'm most worried about, uh, doing everything in his power to delegitimize, at least in the eyes of his more fanatical followers, the incoming administration. We need right now somebody like President Biden and Vice President Harris to bring us together as far as that's possible because we've got to start healing the wounds that have been inflicted upon us over the last four years. And if Donald is actively trying to undermine them, that's going to be so much harder. Yeah, that's a very good point. And in many ways, I described him as the salt being poured into the wound, yeah. uh, our massive divide. And, yeah. and I'm curious, you know, and, and I mentioned before you joined us, Mary, that you cannot deny that more than 70 million Americans uh, support it. President Donald Trump and wanted him to be reelected and serve another four years. And I'm curious, what hold do you think, I mean, as a psychologist and someone who has studied as a clinical psychologist and understands people's sort of pathologies, why do you think he has such a hold on his followers? Um, I guess there, there, you can't necessarily generalize, but are there, are there pockets of his followers that his whole cult of personality appeals to? Sure. And, and honestly, that's the least worrisome thing because there always are. You know, there's always going to be 22 to 28 percent of any population that's going to be the worst among us, right? And like one, one of the um, uh, functions of liberal democracy is to contain those people. What's happened in the last four years is that, well, certainly between 2016 and 2018, a hundred percent of the federal government represented and empowered those people. And it just sort of metastasized. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're, we're gonna have to, we have a lot of work to do in this country in many ways, but one of the things we're going to figure out is how not just that 22 to 28% thought that four more years of this was a good idea, but that another 10, 15 percent, that number is devastating to me. And it's, it's one of the reasons why 
this Biden-Harris victory, as necessary as it was, as heartening as it is, um, is not without um, concern. You know, it's, it's not like we can just be completely happy because the repudiation of Donald and his enablers that we needed didn't happen to the degree it needed to happen. So, um, I mean, honestly, I, I'm hanging on to the hope. I'm hanging on to the good stuff. No more Bill Barr, no more Jared, no more Mike Pompeo, and on and on and on. We have Joe Biden. We have the first female vice president, the first African-American, the first South Asian-American. I mean, it's extraordinary. We have to hang on to the good stuff. But uh, the fact that in excess of 70 million people voted for four more years of this is quite frankly soul crushing. I want to, I'm curious, you observed him for many years. Um, it's hard to get inside his head at any point, but also to get inside his head right now. But um, what kind of behavior do you believe he might be exhibiting right now in the wake of this, uh, you know, blow to his ego and to his presidency? I would guess that he, he's in a state of denial, but you know, he's also being confronted with the reality that is almost impossible for him to process. Uh, my guess is that he's in a rage, the likes of which he's never experienced before, because we need to remember he's never, um, he's never been in a situation that somebody else couldn't get him out of, whether through money or influence or looking the other way, what have you. So it's, one of the weird things about Donald, he's actually never won anything because he's always had somebody else throwing millions of dollars at him. He's always had somebody overlooking his debts. He's always uh, cheated, lied, and steal, stolen to, to, to get what he wants. He can't do that now. So in addition to being enraged by the fact of the loss, he's des made desperate by the fact that he's entirely trapped by it as well. It is not the White House, as I said, or well, I said golf course, but now it's the, I'm assuming he's finished playing golf. Um, although there is a poetic justice to the fact that Fox News called the race for Biden while Donald was playing golf. Um, the White House is not going to be a comfortable place for any, or potentially safe place for anybody to be. And I mean safe in addition to the fact that they all keep getting COVID because they are incapable of uh, taking this virus seriously. Someone asked if he could be suicidal. I mean, that's not part of his pathology. No, no, that, that, is, ne that is beyond my comprehension to believe that that hap would happen. Um, what I would say, though, is that if Donald feels like he's going down, he'll take the rest of us down with him. And he actually, that's what he was trying to do. What that speech that he gave, or whatever it was, early Wednesday morning, uh, that was an attempted coup. And we, we can't, you know, tiptoe around this. Luckily, it wasn't successful. But he was actively encouraging people to protest. We have poll workers who, are, who need security now, and they're getting death threats. You know, it's, it's insanity. And the longer we went without a clear result, the more that was happening. You know, he has so violated almost every norm during the course of his presidency. And there are norms that have been followed uh, for a very long time when it comes to a peaceful transition of power. You know, you saw, even though it felt slightly uncomfortable, President Obama, First Lady Michelle Obama, inviting uh, President-elect Trump, Melania, to the White House. You saw Hillary Clinton at the inauguration of your uncle. Uh, will any of these norms be recognized in your view? No, um, I, I don't believe, and it, look, there's, there's no 100% guarantee, although I would say it's a 99.999% chance he doesn't go to the inauguration. It's extraordinarily unlikely that he um, calls uh, President Biden. Um, it's extremely unlikely he concedes in any way. Um, he will do the opposite of help the incoming administration with uh, the uh, transfer of power. And I honestly, I think that's better because 
it's just another way to help people understand who this person is. He has no honor. He has no grace. Um, and, you know, to put it in, in uh, the most basic terms, he's a sore loser. So you, you doubt that he'll the inauguration, which will be so strange, right? Uh, you know, I was, I was watching John McCain's concession speech and I posted it on my Instagram because, uh, you know, it was so full of grace and decency and people started booing when he mentioned uh, Barack Obama and he told them to stop. Right. And, uh, so you don't think any of, he won't go to the inauguration. He will just, well, what is he gonna do next, do you think? And do you think he'll continue uh, to want to want to have a voice in politics? Do you believe that he is going to start a media company as many people speculated? It's a little hard for me to see Donald's wanting to stay relevant in politics because, you know, it'll be many, many steps down. Uh, and that in a, that would also be a concession, right? Uh, he won't be the person in charge anymore. Um, and I think also, especially if he continues this kind of behavior, he's going to lose relevance, if not with his followers, then certainly with Republican leadership. And I think the more uh, they see that as aligning themselves with him is both um, unhelpful, but also unnecessary, they're not going to do it anymore. And... Um, you know, he may continue holding rallies, which is weird, but, you know, he needs those rallies more than, than the people who attend them need them. And he may indeed uh, do something in the media, uh, but if there's any justice in the world, he'll also be faced with indictments. Uh, he's got quite a few lawsuits heading his way. And if President Biden and Vice President Harris you know, or stick to their word, which I have every reason to believe they will, there will be a presidential crimes commission. Well, uh, right now, your uh, uncle tweeted about a minute ago, the observers were not allowed into the counting rooms. I won the election, got 71 million legal votes. Bad, th bad things happened, which our observers were not allowed to see. Never happened before. Millions of mail-in ballots were sent to people who never asked for them. He sort of, isn't he? I'm sorry? He seems as if he's flailing. He's flailing, but again, even though it's not as, as, as bad as it was when we didn't know the results of the election, this is incredibly dangerous. And for Republican leaders to continue to fail to speak out clearly and, and, and with vehemence against this kind of behavior is an indictment on them. It's, it's just, this, it can't continue. It, it just cannot continue. When do you expect, um, I mean, gosh, your guess, I guess, is as good as mine, Mary, but when do you expect Republican leaders like Mitch McConnell and others to come out and say, the election is over, uh, Joe Biden is the president-elect, and uh, we need to prepare for a peaceful transition of power. Because once enough people say that, it's harder and harder for him to keep uh, fighting. And he just tweeted 71 million votes, the most ever for a sitting president, which, of course, reflects the turnout uh, and, and the massive turnout. But he's, he's kind of uh, positioning this as you know, a, a, a huge, um, uh, I guess, imprimatur on his presidency. And uh, anyway, I guess the question is, do you expect the, some of these key Republicans to speak out? I, you know, I have very little faith in uh, their ability to deal fairly <laughs> at all. But if they come to the conclusion, which they should, that this is, this is really counterproductive for them. Uh, this will make it, if they continue to stay silent, this will make it almost impossible 
for there to be any kind of cooperation between a Biden administration and Republican leadership, because they're endangering our country. They're endangering the citizens of this country by allowing Donald's delusional nonsense to hang out there because he's not just some random guy on a street corner. He's still the man in the Oval Office with all of the attendant power. And people listen to him. I know that's hard. It's hard for me to understand. And I know, you know, along with many other people, I'm going to be trying to figure that out for a very long time. But people do listen to him. And um, I, I think it, it's only going to happen when Mitch McConnell realizes that it is in his self-interest to speak out. You know, in closing, Mary, I was just wondering, I mean, if he wants to be remembered in any positive light for anything that he was able to do, let's say some of the things he did in the Middle East or, you know, uh, with some of, you know, whatever he deemed. It's hard to think of anything. Well, isn't it? <laughs> his accomplishments. Um, isn't he afraid of the blight that will be on his uh, the stain on his presidency if he has absolutely 0.0, .0 graciousness during this period of time? Uh, if he were reasonable, then yeah. But um, he's incapable of seeing it that way. Um, because again, this is a unique situation for him. He does not know how to deal with it. And being gracious in the way you suggest would be to admit something he cannot admit. Uh, so, and also in his mind, there's nothing he can do, um, that's wrong. So, um, he feels that what he's doing now is projecting strength and, um, you know, his record is perfect and he's done everything right. I, I hope he gets to the point where he decides that the problem is America and that we don't deserve him. So he's just going to go off and do something more important than lead the country. Um, you know, but he's never going to acknowledge the 75 million people who didn't vote for him or the fact that he indeed is one of only four incumbent presidents to lose after his first term. So Twitter saying he was fine playing golf, but then uh, he came back. Once he came back. Once he came back and saw the nonstop coverage, uh, he was very upset, needless to say. Well, yeah. a lot of people are saying how much they appreciate the fact that you wrote this book, that it was a very brave thing for you to do. I think that, um, you know, I hope that, that Joe Biden, as he has said, will be the president for all Americans, even those who did not vote for him. And uh, that somehow uh, we, can, we can shift into a new, a new chapter for this country. But as you said, that's gonna, that's gonna probably take a long time. Did you get much, uh, how much blowback did you get that maybe you can share with us from the Trump family for the book, or did they just choose to ignore it? it it's actually really fascinating. I, uh, I took the necessary precautions, uh, shall we say, um, but nothing happened. Uh, you know, as I'm sure you're very well aware, whistleblowers do not fare well in this administration. Um, either their reputations get ruined, they lose their jobs, they get death threats or some combination of all of those things. So I was fully prepared uh, for some of that to happen and none of it did. So I think that the fact that I'm shocked by that is a very sad commentary on where we are as a country. But um, I mean, I'm glad none of that happened, obviously. Uh, so, you know, it made it easier, of course, for me to speak out. Um, but you know, nobody, no, uh, certainly no, was, and I mean, what I did, I wrote a book. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's nothing compared to what people like Lieutenant Colonel Vidman did, or Olivia Troy, or Fiona Hill, and Maria Yovanovitch, and, and on and on and on. I mean, those people really put their lives on the line uh, to affect change in this country and to speak truth to power. So, um, 
you know, we have a new in in administration come in. We need to strengthen whistleblower rules and protections. Um, but no, my family, and I think it's possibly because, um, you know, they knew that, that doing anything would just make it worse for them. And, and finally, you know, I just, I don't want everyone who, for whatever reason, supported him to feel totally disenfranchised moving forward. Um, as someone who is a, a clinical psychologist, I mean, what would you say to people who today are quite disappointed and feel that uh, that the election didn't turn out the way they were hoping it would. Um, I, you know, I think we have to start putting ourselves in other people's shoes and understanding that they may see things differently. So, what would what would you say to them, Mary? Well, first of all, I'd say I can empathize. <laughs> you know. Um, and we've all experienced elections that have been dis either disappointing or bitterly disappointing or heartbreaking. And it's an awful feeling. What I would say, however, is just give it a chance. You know, we're, we're looking at, uh, as you said, Joe Biden has made it clear that he wants to be a president for all Americans, not just Americans who voted for him. We have not had that situation in the last four years. Uh, so it is it's not up to him. It's up to the people who may be reluctant to have him as president to accept that, right? So I would say, yes, give it a chance. See what it's, see what it's going to be like to live in a country where you don't have to worry about health care, where we are going to um, eradicate or at least contain the coronavirus so we can get our co economy going again so we can start saving the planet from catastrophic climate change. Just give it a chance, guys. We haven't done that before. And just see, you know, your lives might improve drastically. Um, you know, maybe uh, you won't get to be as blatantly racist and misogynistic um, as you were under a president who champions those things. But I'm not entirely sure how, you know, being racist and misogynistic, et cetera, et cetera, improves anybody's life anyway. Well, it's, uh, it, it's going to be an interesting time. And I think that, you know, I think psychologically, people will need to adjust to a White House that doesn't operate under so much chaos, where <laughs> everything is almost, uh, you know, is, is, is heightened and fraught and, you know, and, 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 you know, quite frankly, unsettling, uh, yep. at the least. I mean, that's probably yep. uh, really is not even a strong enough word. So I think maybe everyone needs to take a deep breath. And I think, you know, people need to celebrate uh, those who feel excited that Joe Biden is going to be the next president of the United States, Kamala Harris, as you mentioned, of course, next vice president of the United States. And hopefully uh, we can all, you know, I don't, I don't have any delusions that we're all gonna come together, but perhaps yeah. the temperature can be reduced and people can actually go back to having civil conversations about policy and not about the cult of personality. I think the cult of personality elected Donald Trump and the cult of, cult of person, his cult of personality defeated ultimately Donald Trump. And now maybe we can focus less on personality and more on a positive direction for the country. Yeah, I, I think you're exactly right. We cannot underestimate what a relief it's going to be for all of us, regardless of our politics, to relax, you know, not to be constantly bombarded with chaos and division and hate. It's that's just turning the temperature down in that way, as you said, is going to it's going to get us a long way, honestly, towards achieving uh, healing. I mean, it's going to take a while, but just at the very beginning, that alone is good. I mean, just imagine being able to sleep. What a concept. Or not up and saying, what was tweeted this morning? Right, I, <laughs> right. And, you know, I hope that a Biden administration, social media, but not quite to this extent. Yeah, I mean, honestly, when, when Donald came up with his stupid nickname, Sleepy Joe, I was like, I'm all for that. <laughs> you know, Sleepy, I want to be able to forget about him for a few days at a time. Sounds good to me. <laughs> well, as Michael Che said, uh, 
he said, make the news boring again. And uh, I think that, that as, as I said, everybody could use, I think, a little more calm in our lives. And uh, <sighs> anyway, Mary, <laughs> what can I say? I think everyone is, uh, is feeling pretty verklempt today, happy. <laughs> yes, also, indeed. Also relieved, as John Meacham said, our republic lives to see another day because I, I just don't know how our democracy could have withstood four more years of this uh, chaotic administration. No, and, and that's, that's so true. And that's the main thing we need to hang on to, or one of the main things, is we pulled our democracy back from the brink and we finally will have the opportunity to make the changes that need to be changed, or that need to be made, rather. We would not have had that opportunity. Four more years of this, would have um, ended the American experiment. And I do not think that's hyperbole. All right. Well, on that note, um, Mary, thank you so much. It's, it's great to spend some time talking to you. Someone said I had gotten teeth. I, these comments are so bizarre. Someone else said I ate children. I'm like, hi. Well, you know, uh, this that's is what we're dealing with. Those are the people who need to, you know, be contained. Yeah. Right? Well, you know what? Let's, I, I want to, I want to be generous to people and it doesn't even bother me. It's sort of like, you know, people who are angry or fearful, people who are fearful, right. uh, need our empathy and, and, and support instead of, you know, I think, which, which is a natural reflex to, to hate back. And right. I think whenever we can be compassionate to people, we're going to, we're going to be able to to kind of be more unified and move forward together. Cause you know, as I was saying to my friends that we all pretty much want the same things, Mary, right? We want our health. We want to have opportunities. We want our kids to be well-educated and to do well in life. We want to enjoy ourselves. We want to be proud of our country, you know? So, that's, I think we have to remember that a lot of people really do want the same things. And those who don't just need to be helped uh, to see and understand. And maybe they're just not the product of the same education that we've all been lucky enough to have. So, um, yeah. you know, I don't know. I just sort of feel like uh, that's, we, we got to start moving in that direction somehow. Yeah, I think education is the long-term fix here, but in the short term, uh, I could not agree with you more. And I, this is going to be really hard. It's hard to have compassion to be, uh, towards people who wish you ill and who say the most vile things about you. But the truth of the matter is that behind cruelty, as you said, is terror. We need to figure out why these people are so afraid and help them not be. I could not agree with you more, Mary. Anyway, well, hopefully our paths will cross one of these days and we'll be able to spend some time in person. But great to, great to be with you, Mary. Thanks so much. And everyone who joined our conversation and took part in this, thank you all as well. Thanks, guys. It was great to be here. Thank you so much, Katie. Okay, bye, Stay Mary. Stay safe. If you guys like what you see, subscribe right here.